Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. The question I get asked fairly often is, what are all of the different shapes that you see on lathe tools used for? If you buy a pre-ground set from somewhere like Grizzly, hashtag not sponsored, or from Little Machine Shop, hashtag not sponsored, or if you buy a collection of high-speed steel from a machine shop auction, all of these different shapes are presented in high-speed steel or carbide. What are they all for? How do you use them? Let's find out right now. One of the most common questions I get asked from beginners to hobby machine shop work is, why are there so many shapes of high-speed steel tooling? And what are all these shapes for? Well, the short answer is, they're for whatever they work for. All right, good video. Thanks, everyone. I'm just kidding. But there really is a kernel of truth to that. Fundamentally, every tool bit shape that you might see in a machine shop doesn't necessarily have a specific purpose. They all have a broad use case, but the truth is you can use any shape of tool in any situation where it's going to get in and do the thing that you need. So it's really more important to understand what the different angles on tools are for and thus how they might apply in all the different situations. A really good example of what I mean is what's really fundamentally the difference between grooving tools and a parting blade? Well, really there's no practical difference except that Grooving tools are generally shorter and more rigid and have less reach, but otherwise, these are doing fundamentally the same job. A parting blade is just a tool that makes a really, really deep groove until, well, there's nowhere to make a groove anymore because the part is in the chip tray. Parting blades are generally taller than grooving tools, but that's just because they also tend to be thinner and the height gives them lots and lots of support and thus strength for cutting deeply into parts but there's nothing fundamentally different about the cutting geometry of a parting blade versus a grooving tool. And in fact, lots of grooving operations can be done with parting blades if the width happens to be what you need. So again, you don't necessarily want to look at this and say, well, that's a grooving tool and that's a parting blade when this one here in the middle is kind of in the middle, right? It's a grooving tool. I would call it a grooving tool, but also it is quite long and it is quite tall, so it could be perfectly reasonably used as a parting blade for a certain diameter of part. It's got less reach than a parting blade, and it's a little bit wider, so it's going to be higher tool pressure, but it's a parting blade as much as it is a grooving tool. But we can at least group tools into some broad categories, which will help understand what they're all for. I would say you can group tools into two major categories, let's say. Turning tools and form tools, and a third category with its like other. So let's start with turning tools. Again, take all of this with a grain of salt because no tool is really for one specific thing, but in general, it's helpful to have a name for things. You gotta name stuff something. And there are certainly tools that are generally used for turning and things that are generally used for form cutting. So looking at this array of tools, which of these would you say are the turning tools? Now, how well did that match up with your guess? There's definitely two here that you might have disagreed on, and that's okay. These two here are definitely in a gray area, so you could call those turning tools, but let's go ahead and call these the turning tools and take a look at what makes them turning tools. I would call this the absolute most basic form of turning tool, so it's helpful to start here and understand what makes it what it is. What we've got here is a flat top, so this is going to be for brass, the angle on the top of the tool is your top rake. And then on the other two sides, we've got clearance angles. So we've got this angle here, which slopes away from the work on the underside of the cutting edge. This being right here is the cutting edge. And the purpose of a clearance angle is to make sure the tool doesn't rub on the work as it moves through, of course. And then there's another clearance angle on the end, which once again slopes down and away from the tool. So everything underneath are clearance angles and everything on top are your top rake. Now between the top rake and your clearance angle is what defines the cutting edge. And the location of the cutting edge really defines what a tool is quote unquote for. So what makes this a turning tool 
is that the cutting edge is right here, and so the tool is meant to be fed this way against the work, like so. So it's cutting right here as the carriage moves sideways, and thus this is clearly a turning tool. And specifically a turning tool for brass because it has zero top rake. Every material has a top rake angle that it wants. Those angles are pretty fudgy. You can use a lot of different angles for a lot of different materials, but in general brass is going to be zero and most other things are going to be 10 degrees. So stepping up a little bit in complexity now would be this guy. Also still obviously a turning tool, but you can see a few key differences. One is that it has a top rake angle on it. You can see that the top surface falls back and away from the cutting edge. It's a compound angle. That's the top rake. This is a top rake of 10 degrees. So this is going to be for cutting steel and eh, most other things, frankly. The other key difference is that the angle back here is different. This one up here is, uh, I don't know, probably 60, 70 degrees. And then this angle back here is 55 degrees. I know because I ground it specifically to clear the live center on my lathe. This angle back here is just for clearance around tooling on the lathe. It has no role in the cutting action of the tool. To put a finer point on that, if you'll pardon the pun, this is also a turning tool. You can see that it's essentially square. What's happening back here is all pragmatic. It has nothing to do with cutting. The business end up here, once again, We've got our clearance angle underneath the cutting edge and the clearance angle on the end so we don't rub on the part. But the cutting edge is right here, same as on the other turning tools. So even though this thing looks square on the end, it's still a perfectly skookum cutting tool. And the top rake, as you can see, is done with a curved groove that's been ground in the end. This is the sign of a factory-made turning tool. In fact, this is from the Grizzly pre-ground set. And they do that because it's just really easy to get a machine to grind a round groove in that. And then the angle right behind the cutting edge is still 10 degrees, even though it looks very much different from a tool like this, which is doing the same thing. It's got a 10 degree angle behind the cutting edge, but this is what happens when you grind it by hand, and this is what happens when a machine does it. This little dog leg bend in the tool steel is there for no other purpose than to increase the reach of the tool. This allows you to get a little closer to the chuck without the tool interfering. So if you ignore all of the pragmatic oddities like the absence of a clearance for the live center and the weird dog leg in the tool steel, then you can see that this is fundamentally just a turning tool. Even though as a beginner at first glance you might look at that and go, what the heck is that for? But wait, there's more. Turning tools come in two flavors. These ones that I've shown you so far are quote-unquote normal turning tools or right-hand turning tools. However, all the same tools come in a left-hand variety. So this looks very much the same except the cutting edge is on the other side. The purpose of this, of course, is for cutting in the other direction. So when feeding this way in the material, let's say you've got a groove in your stock that's near the chuck, you can feed the tool into that groove so it's not touching the work yet, and then feed across to cut from left to right. Another common use case for left-hand tools is to put them in the back of the tool post and then use them for facing, because this is then effectively a left-hand cutting operation if you feed in along the back of the tool post. Now, what about this tool? This is one of the ones I called out as a turning tool. Does that look like a turning tool to you? It's a pretty weird one, right? There's a lot more going on than is on these other tools. Well, once again, fundamentally, we've got a cutting edge with a 10 degree top rake angle behind it and clearance is underneath and the cutting edge is on the forward side of the tool so this is a turning tool. However, the cutting edge is at an angle as you see. And this angle right here is called the lead angle. And what that does is it presents the cutting edge at an angle to the work other than square. So if this tool was feeding like this, that would make it square to the work but if we square up the tool post and feed it like this, then we've got a lead angle on the cutting edge. The purpose of lead angle is that it actually improves surface finish at the cost of slightly higher tool pressure. So these tools here, for example, have zero lead angle. They're always presenting the cutting edge square to the work, assuming the tool post is square. You can always create lead angle in either direction with tool post angle if you want, but generally speaking, you present the tool square, and run it across the work. So mostly you see me using tools like this, and you don't see me using a tool like that. But if you look in all of the books and tell you how to grind tool bits, they'll all tell you that you need this lead angle. 
And why is that? Well, again, it's trading surface finish for tool pressure, which makes perfect sense on big industrial machinery. Here in the hobby shop, however, we need to worry more about minimizing tool pressure. So the benefits of a, of a lead angle on your tool bit, in my experience, are basically zero. So it's much more convenient, easier to grind, and just as good to have a square lead angle on your tools. So I don't bother grinding an angle like that, so you don't see me using a tool like this in that way. However, a tool like this has another trick up its sleeve. This angle up here is less than 90 degrees. It's usually 85 or 80 degrees. And what that means is you can turn your tool post at an angle and you can get in close to a shoulder on a part. Here's an example of how that works. So you can see as this tool goes in there, because that angle on the end is 85 degrees, slightly less than 90, there's an angle that you can set on your tool post that will allow you to turn in here right up to this shoulder without the tool ever run, rubbing on either of these two surfaces. So anytime you see a tool that has an 80 or an 85 degree angle on the end, there's a good chance that this is why. It's so that you can combine it with tool post angle and get yourself an inside shoulder turning tool. The second major category that I described at the top was form tools. Here's a few examples of those that you're likely to encounter. The most common is probably the chamfering tool or the chamfering tool if you are a member of the Commonwealth outside of Canada. This guy of course puts small 45 degree angles on everything which is what separates us from the animals. Then these guys are kind of more traditional what you might think of as form tools. They're called form tools because they are the exact shape of a form that you want to put into the part. Here's a couple of round nosed tool bits that you would use to create round grooves in things for decorative purposes or to create stress relief grooves, things like that. You'll also sometimes see large round nose tools like this used as finishing tools. If you've seen my videos on surface finish, then you know that nose radius is one of the major factors in how good your surface finishes are. The larger the nose radius, the better your finish is going to be in general, but of course the higher your tool pressure is, so you have to take lighter cuts with a large nose radius. But taking that to the extreme with a tool like this and a very, very light cut, you can actually get quite an outstanding surface finish. So that's another use case for a tool like this, and once again, the reason why none of these rules are absolute as to what tool bit shape is used for what. This guy over here is a little more of a gray area. I've lumped it in with form tools because I ground this initially because I was turning a part that had a 30 degree angle that it needed to create on a shoulder. So this is a 30 degree angle on the sides of this tool, but it was used as a turning tool. However, it was creating an inside nose radius and a 35 degree angle on the side of the part at the same time. So it was kind of a form tool. Now let's get into the eh, miscellaneous. You might encounter other weird shapes of tool bits that you're not sure exactly what they are. And well, sometimes it's a bit of a guess, but again, at the end of the day, Whatever you can use that tool for is what it's for. This guy looks very much like the 30 degree tool that I just showed you, but it has a top rake on it. So this isn't gonna be a form tool. Form tools generally have to have a zero top rake on them. So this would be a tool for sneaking into tight corners, creating little grooves in things, removing small fillets on inside shoulders, things like that. Anywhere you need to get into a really, really tight space. This tool is an interesting one. You might find this in a box somewhere and think it might be a turning tool because it does look quite a bit like this tool. However, this isn't going to likely be a standard right hand turning tool because this side here, which would be the cutting edge, is quite short. So is this a left hand turning tool? Well, maybe, and it would certainly work for that in something like brass since it has zero top rake. However, the giveaway on this is the angle. Anytime you see an angle on the end of a tool like that that looks suspiciously like it might be 60 degrees, and in fact it is 60 degrees, that's a threading tool. Now threading tools come with different biases. Frequently you'll see them biased to the left like this because that allows you to get the tool close to an inside shoulder where you want to start your thread. So you'll see a very short angle on this side and a much larger one on this side, but you will also see them centered or even biased to the right if they're intended to be run upside down for left to right threading. The latter is what you typically see me do on this channel, so my threading tools are typically upside down. But if you see a tool like this that has a suspiciously 60 looking angle on it, it is in fact a threading tool. Now what about this guy? This almost looks like an internal threading tool, doesn't it? But that angle, not 60 degrees, so it's not a threading tool. 
This is in fact a boring bar. These days you more typically see boring bars that look like this where there's an insert in them and so it's more obvious what it actually is. However, the old-fashioned way to do this and still the way it's done for very small boring bars and other special cases is to grind the boring bar shape out of a solid chunk of high-speed steel. So that's what this is. I put them side by side. You can see that they really are the same tool. One has just been ground from a solid chunk of high-speed steel and the other one is using a fancy insert. You don't typically see me using these guys, again, unless I need a really, really tiny one because you can see how much grinding is involved to create this shape. You need a lot of clearance around a boring bar and this area here limits how deep the boring bar can go before you run out of clearance on the shank of the tool, whereas a tool like this can go much deeper. So it's a lot of work to create a tool like that. The reason I have this one is because this comes in the Grizzly pre-ground set, so that's been ground by a machine. But if you had to do this yourself on a bench grinder, you'd be there quite a long time. So uh, again, unless you're making very, very small boring bars, inserts are definitely the way to go. All right, but maybe you think you're too cool for high-speed steel. You might be thinking, oh, I'm just going to go all carbide and then I won't have any of these problems. Well, these skills for identifying the purposes of high-speed steel also apply to carbide. Carbide has all of the same constraints as uh, high-speed steel tools do. It's just that they come in different shapes and the business end is detachable, but the shapes are still the same. So these guys, for example, are your standard right hand and left hand turning tools. And you'll note that this angle on the end here is less than 90 degrees, once again, so you can get into tight corners on shoulders. So these also function as a standard turning tool and an inside shoulder tool. This triangular insert shape is kind of my go-to for that reason. It's very, very flexible, and these simple insert shapes are inexpensive. The downside to going all carbide insert, if that is your dream, is that you will need a lot of carbide inserts. All these crazy high-speed steel shapes I've been showing you, you will need all of them sooner or later. And yes, there are carbide insert versions of all of them, but you're going to have to buy all of them, and a lot of the more exotic ones like grooving tools or some of the form tools, they require special holders, special shanks, and special tools to remove and attach the inserts and so on. So it very quickly explodes into a whole world of exotic tooling and support tooling for the tooling and support tools for the support tooling for the tooling and so on. So before you poo-poo good old-fashioned high-speed steel, consider the investment. You'll see me using uh, carbide insert turning tools a lot because for basic turning you only need really a single shape. This is the only shape of carbide insert that I use and one of these will go a really long way in a hobby shop and they perform extremely well. So it's a quick shortcut to perfect tool geometry for the basic jobs but for all the exotic stuff, the grooving and the form tools and so on, I go to high speed steel. That's all peachy but here's the thing about tool bit shapes. You really can't discuss them without also discussing tool post angle because the two are closely related. In this orientation, the standard square tool post orientation, our basic turning tool is just that. It's a basic turning tool. Presented to the work and fed sideways, it's gonna turn the outside diameter. However, watch what happens when I turn this tool post. If I turn it a little bit like this, our basic turning tool is now an inside shoulder turning tool. Putting a little bit of angle on that gives the tool clearance on both surfaces when it's inside that 90 degree corner. So I can now feed across to turn that diameter. And when I get to the inside corner, I can feed out on my cross slide to face this surface right here, nice and square to this one, all with no rubbing because of the clearance afforded by a little bit of tool post angle, even though this is officially just a turning tool. Now watch what happens if I turn a little further, all the way over to here, such that the back surface of the tool is now parallel to the lathe spindle. Now when it's presented to the end of the work, like so, and fed with the cross slide, the end of the tool becomes the cutting edge, which is square to the surface that we want to create. Again, there's our zero lead angle, and that simple turning tool is now a facing tool, just with a little bit of tool post angle once again. However, there's a catch. That works perfectly fine in this case because this is a zero top rake tool, and you would use it on brass, not aluminum, but if you're using this in brass, you can face just fine with that tool geometry. However, much of the time, turning tools have the wrong geometry to be used for facing. Here's a more traditional or standard turning tool that has a top rake on it for steel and other materials. 
and you've got the clearance angles. There's the end of the tool, so you can see what that looks like. You can see the clearance angles on the front and the top of the tool. However, if I do this same trick, turn the tool to an angle to present a square edge to the face of the work, and then try to push that through, it's not really going to work very well because imagine when this tool is turning this way, underneath that clearance angle, which falls directly away from the front leading edge, that creates the cutting edge. However, on the end of the tool, I've got an angle that falls away and back because the purpose of this clearance on the back is to clear this surface of the tool as it moves along. So this compound angle clearance on the front falls away from the cutting edge, but not square. It falls away and back from the cutting edge. So if I push it through the work like that, it's not actually presenting a square 10 degree cutting edge to the work. It's presenting a crooked cutting edge to the work. However, if you're taking light cuts, you still get away with that. If you're just doing eh, 10 thou depth of cuts, something like that, you can get away with using the tool that way. But if you're trying to do heavy facing cuts and it's not working very well and you're using a turning tool at an angle, that's probably why. If you're wanting to do heavy facing cuts, you really want to use either a dedicated facing tool. Those do exist. They look kind of like a grooving tool because they're designed to be pushed into the work with a square tool post. Or an easier trick that I like is to simply use a left hand turning tool. Put a left hand turning tool on the back of the tool post, just like magic. That's now a facing tool. I can feed that forward. The cutting edge is presented square to the work and we're feeding it in the direction it's designed to cut. And so the clearances and cutting edge geometry are all correct. The other advantage to this approach versus tilting your turning tool for facing is that frequently you want to face a surface and then turn the same part or turn and face back and forth or face, turn, cut a shoulder. You're typically doing a lot of those operations all kind of in the same quick succession. And this method allows you to leave your tool post square throughout all of those operations, which saves you a non-trivial amount of time. If you're having to tilt your tool post angle and then square it up again every time you change tools, that adds quite a bit of time to the operations. And since we're talking about squaring up the tool post, how do you actually do that? It's a bunch of easy, quick ways to do it that all generally involve finding something on the lathe that's square that you can run the tool post up against. So tool post loose. In this case, I have access to the front of my collet chuck. Just feed the carriage into that. Give a little help there. There you go, squares itself up, and then you tighten it down right there. Bob's your uncle, tool post is square. You can also use the face of the work if it's been faced and it's square, the same way that we used the face of the chuck, or as is more often the case, everything up here is busy, but the tailstock is available. So the same trick works here. Just run the tool post up against the tailstock quill and tighten down in that position. Or as is often the case, if you've got the drill chuck in there and you don't have access to the quill, you can remove the drill chuck, of course, but often it's just quicker to run the jaws in because this surface here is also very square on the drill chuck. So run that up there, tighten that down, Bob's your uncle. Another common scenario is if you have the chuck in here and you've got work and maybe the tailstock has a center in it, you don't want to take the center out. Another trick I use a lot is to use the face of the chuck and just put a one, two, three block in there to get around the work that's in the chuck. And once again, square it up like so. Tighten that down, good and square. These methods are good enough, incidentally, because absolute perfect to the tenth squareness on the tool post doesn't actually matter. Remember that the squareness of all of your cuts is set by the travel of the slides. Tool post angle is just about getting clearances and getting the tool in where you need it. Now you can use the cutting edge of a turning tool to create small shoulders. And if you're doing that, then that cutting edge is acting as a form tool, in which case the angle of your tool post does matter because if your tool post is a little bit crooked, then you're creating a slightly crooked shoulder. However, that's why it's not good practice to do that if the squareness of that shoulder really matters. In that case, you always want to make sure that you're single point cutting that shoulder by using an inside corner turning tool and using the cross slide to face that shoulder to guarantee absolute squareness, because then the squareness of that shoulder is controlled by the slides on the lathe. Now, let's say you went on eBay or to a machine shop auction or you have a YouTube channel and people generously send you stuff, you might end up with something like this. Now, these 
random piles of high-speed steel are frequently for sale for very, very little money at machine shop auctions, state sales, things like that. And they're really a gold mine of the accumulated wisdom of some previous machinist. You'll find tools in here for pretty much every purpose that that previous machinist needed. And that's where the skills that we've learned today really come in handy because you can look through all of these tools and understand what that machinist probably used them for. So here, for example, is a classic left-hand turning tool. And that's very clearly what that was. It was quite small, so he or she probably ground that to get into a small space. On the other end of that same tool, we've got a little pointy bit, which looks suspiciously like 60 degrees. And indeed it is, so that might be a threading tool, although threading tools being form tools require zero top rake. And this has a rake ground on it. So that might just be a pointy tool that was ground to get into a narrow space, perhaps an inside shoulder, and maybe they ground it to 60 degrees just out of habit, or it might have been ground to slightly less than 60, that might actually be 58, something like that, in order to get clearance around a live center in a lathe, something like that. You'll find a lot of this sort of thing. That's clearly a grooving tool on one end and on the other. Basic grooving tools of many different widths are super common in grab boxes like this because for every O-ring or snap ring or gasket or what have you, you always need a special exact width groove. So grinding a high-speed steel tool of that width is usually the easiest way to do it. You'll also often find exotic grinds like this. This is clearly a really tiny turning tool that was needed to get in really deep somewhere. Looks like maybe it was for facing the back of a small hole. The top rake is ground into it using the edge of a grinding wheel, the same way that the Grizzly tools were. So it's designed to cut in the normal cutting direction, but because it's so thin and long, it suggests it was needed to get in deep somewhere. You'll also find random form tools. There's a round nose tool, although again, has a top rake on it, so maybe that was a finishing tool, something like that. This is also really common in these grab boxes. This looks like a one-off boring bar that was ground from something in order to get in deep on a fairly small diameter hole. Yeah, that right there looks like probably an internal threading tool. Survey says, yeah, it's very close to 60 degrees, so that's probably a threading tool. And it's nice and long, also the sign of an internal threading tool. Could be a boring bar, but because the end is sharp, that suggests threading tool. If there was more of a nose radius on it, then I would say boring bar. But the line between inside threading tool and boring bar is pretty blurry. That would probably work for either. Anyway, you get the idea. So inside these boxes, you'll find all sorts of interesting and strange and wondrous tools. And uh, once you understand the geometry of all the various tool shapes and how and where they're used, then you can identify the likely intent of all of these tools. But again, less important than the intent of the original grinder is how you can use it for the various operations that you're trying to do. I hope this answered all of your questions about lathe tool shapes, what they're all for, how to identify them, and how to figure out what you can use them for. If you have more questions on this topic, feel free to send me a note and I'm happy to address it in future videos. This video topic was a viewer suggestion. I always love getting suggestions from viewers for topics, so feel free to drop me a line. And thanks to my patrons who make all of this content possible, and I will see you next time.